So hello to everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, yes, my, my main research um, is actually in um, rock art, more specifically Atlantic rock art, but that's not really what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so what is art is one of the things that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so as I said, rock art is a very kind of um, large part of my research interests and um, I often encounter uh, discussions that relate to art so we're always saying what is art is this art is a little scratch art it's like obviously the caves are very beautiful and people usually say that, that they're very artistic they're very beautiful it's art but like what about this they all fall in the same bag of rock art so um, it's a bit complicated and um, when we try to categorize these things um, it, we have to decide what what exactly we're dealing with, um, and um, I have joined briefly some of some discussions that relate to you know this what is art kind of thing because everybody keeps asking about it, um, and I'm really not interested in that discussion uh, because I don't think that will kind of lead us anywhere really. Uh, what I am more interested in is um, what is it that we archaeologists can learn. Uh, from art uh, in order to understand our study objects. Um, so, nevertheless, um, I will, I, I do attempt to kind of define what I study because I, I, I think that we should understand what we're dealing with and I think that definitions are important for us but also to explain to other people what is it that we're doing. Um, and um, I, I quite like Cochrane and Russell's definition of art um, because they use the term in a very um, kind of fluid way um, and I think that their definition that you can read a little bit of here they, they have this in their manifesto you can find it online it's online as well um, so this is what I like to apply to my own work. I like to, you know, use the word art to explore the imagery, the representation, the articulation um, of events, objects. You know, I like, I like to give it this kind of broad spin. Um, and also because I try to avoid um, a sometimes um, short view that we archaeologists have, because we tend to box everything, we like to kind of label everything and put everything in little boxes. And I think that sometimes that prevents us from, you know, advancing in our knowledge, from kind of taking in other um, notions that may be important for us and that, you know, we just keep them away because they don't really fit our little boxes. Um, so, in fact, if I think about, when I start thinking about the word art, um, I found out, and obviously we all know this, I'm sure, uh, that the concept of art is very broad and, and it's a bit disorganized um, in itself uh, because it is, it is a concept that has been evolving uh, throughout time. And uh, it is worth noting that the initial form of the word art was used in antiquity uh, to describe specific and technical matters that we today associate with particular sciences and professions and not so much with, um, you know, artists in kind of a, you know, gallery artists kind of way. Uh, but uh, the application of specialized skills or technical knowledge that, that you know, um, are uh, related to some specific um, fields. It is only in the 18th century um, that the word art becomes associated with contemplation and aesthetic judgment. Um, and this is also when the artists become, you know, are seen by others um, as exceptional people amongst um, the rest of the mortals, I suppose. Um, the notion of art, however, focused on the appreciation and the judgment of artworks and did not accommodate non-Western um, societies that in many cases do not have concepts such as those of as art and artists um, and they give more importance or in some cases they do, ethnographic evidence tells us that they do give more importance to the act of creation rather than the final product. And this is a notion that in the study of prehistoric art we are very interested in. So. In the 19th and early 20th century, the world art is shaken again by new ideas. Uh, the aesthetic vanguard movements 
um, start to kind of uh, you know shake it a little bit and um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of pieces like this one that uh, don't really fit uh, any of the accepted agendas at that time so the concept evolved again and um, Today, many authors believe that the definition of art should not really be pursued, and I, I, I agree with that as well. Um, the best approach is perhaps to adopt a hybrid perspective that will allow for the earliest arts to be included, as well as additions from the outside and you know other traditions. Uh, but also, that will accommodate the, new, the notion should probably accommodate this. Uh, changing character of the word art, its functions, its conventions, and should accept that uh, some artworks just don't fall in any of the established categories. So this leads me to the idea that art can be pretty much anything, really, <laughs> depending on the maker's and the viewer's point of view, obviously. Um, so if we wish to establish boundaries, however, there are a few things that we can say about art, and uh, that is that it comprises ability, process, and product. So art implies skills. Um, it can be beautiful, but it can also be frightening. Uh, it can be created by a number of reasons and serve many purposes. Art can, um, has been used to illustrate, to provoke, to educate, contemplate, display the truth, and immortality. Yep, uh, and glory. Uh, and art can tell a story and make us think. Um, it has been intrinsically connected to religion, ideology and fantasy, but also intellect and emotions, experience, memory, and politics. So art serves a number of disciplines and makes us use uh, and makes use of a series of others. So science, cartography, and also archaeology are some of those cases. Uh, and for example, art has served science since very early times to illustrate processes and machines, and even the human body. Uh, and today, science can, on you know, go around and uh, the other way, the other way around, and, and and science can actually help art um, identify, for instance, the hand of the artist uh, through a series of, of of studies, such as the analysis of Pollock's fractal patterns. So that was part one of my paper. Part two is going to talk about, is there art in archaeology? Um, and the answer to the question on the title of this paper, if archaeology and art are uh, um, a happy marriage, um, I think that the answer is yes. So as with art, the discipline of archaeology is undisciplined, focusing upon both the nature of the objecthood and subjecthood materialism and idealism. It is objective and empirical in methodology, acknowledging the subjectivity and the indeterminacy of interpretation. Um, also, archaeology is predominantly a visual discipline uh, with an imperative to record visually. Uh, and to illustrate this point, Andrew Jones and Paul Bonaventura mention Fred Bohr's essay dealing with the use of photography by colonialist archaeologists in 19th century Egypt, Pompey's plaster casts produced of the victims of Vesuvius by archaeologist uh, Giuseppe Fiorelli in 1863, um, providing archaeological documentation, but also sculptures of the human body. Um, but besides the, the, the photos and the Pompey body casts, there are also numerous drawings related to archaeological study since really the early stages of antiquarianism. So it's something that we've been doing for a while. Um, and obviously there's even these really, really amazing models um, of general pit rivers for some of the archaeological sites of the UK. Um, and in fact, Archaeology seems to be a little bit obsessed with recording and the visual production of our of our study objects. So we meticulously illustrate our record with photographs of the different stages of the archaeological uh, work. Uh, we photograph landscapes, archaeological sites, archaeological materials, um, and we we're kind of uh, so into this photographic recording these days that you know people really, really put an effort into learning how to dominate all these photographic techniques to produce almost professional, if not really professional, photographs. Um, but adding to the photographs, we draw a record as well um, at different scales. So uh, we have field, ex we draw our field excavations, the sections, the trenches, the rocks, 
Um, we draw the artifacts, we draw the landscape, occasionally if you're very skilled. <laughs> um, and lately we also use computers and 3D production to 2D, I suppose, and 3D um, imaging to actually um, record more accurately our, our uh, record. Um, but perhaps archaeology in general is better explained through a graphic record, um, as a lot of us uh, carry our fieldwork notebooks uh, and seem to be more comfortable describing our notes and observations through drawings and sketches. Um, and this is a practice that we probably adopted from antiquarians. Um, the point I really want to make here is that there is a close relationship between archaeology and art uh, when the latter is understood according to a broad notion that encompasses skills and techniques. So we may not consider ourselves to be artists, but each of us develops necessary skills to undertake our jobs that are influenced by a number of techniques used by artists. Um, whether these are related to drawings or photography um, or other more intricate methods. So, part three, archaeology and art. In a previous project, uh, my colleague Helen uh, Chittick and I uh, set ourselves to explore how contemporary art could help us to better understand our study objects. So whilst I was, and I still am, studying Atlantic rock art, Helen's project was about uh, the so-called shapeless jars, uh, date from the um, Iron Age from East Yorkshire. Um, and our aim was to study the archaeological art through practice, learning from the study objects rather than merely about them. So we learned that art can be very useful for the archaeological interpretation of uh, prehistoric art. Um, in my case study, I approached Atlantic rock art, uh, which is a prehistoric tradition of carvings that can be found along the Atlantic facade. It's mostly composed by geometrical and abstract motifs such as concentric circles, spirals, um, cut marks, rosettes, um, although there are some exceptions of other motifs in Portugal and Spain that have animals and, and, and weapons as well. So um, to approach my study object, I created a metaphor portraying rock art as a work of art. Um, I was interested in exploring the human factor uh, and the performance of rock art, um, and so I analyzed it according to three different levels, which are the physical results of the artist's practice, the performance of the artist, and the aesthetic object experienced both by the practitioner and the audience. Um, my first considerations concerned the techniques uh, common to rock art, so carving and painting, uh, and I concluded that the final result depends much on the skills, tools, and the available media. Um, also, that carving implies more physical strength and energy expenditure than paintings, uh, as well as a predetermination of the images to achieve, but also the tools to use. So they really needed to know, you know, how, how the, the rock would react to a certain blow and what kind of uh, tools they would need to use to kind of uh, produce a certain groove. Um, <clears throat> and I... Yes. And in the case of uh, Atlantic rock art, um, the motifs were actually molded to the, to the rocky surface, um, which produces things like this that look very three-dimensional. Um, and also, this means that the choice of the media would be central to the final result of this type of, of, this type of tradition. Um, so, furthermore, I wanted to look at the rock as performance. Uh, so initially rock art, and especially after the, uh, the paintings have been found in the caves, um, these were interpreted as art galleries. Uh, but today the, the notion of process that we gained a lot by studying ethnographic um, you know, societies, well, traditional societies in current days, um, we, we learned that they value the notion of process. So they're, they're not so much about the final product, but the, it's the making that, that is more relevant. Um, and in fact, we can sometimes trace this evidence uh, in the archaeological records. So for instance, in Torblaren, here, um, chunks and, and flakes of quartz were found um, in the crevices of the rocks, and they were interpreted as, uh, as uh, having been placed there deliberately. Um, also, Thorough observations of horizontal stratigraphy of engraved rocks reveal the morphology of the grooves, but also the story of the, uh, of the act of carving. Um, and often we can also kind of reconstruct the remains of carving techniques um, that can be observed depending on the type of rock that we're looking at. 
Um, and also, we also have um, experimental archaeology that uh, is useful not only to analyze technical aspects, but also to reenact the gestures and the ambience and the sensorial experiences. So, using contemporary art as an analogy, uh, Gilbert and George's performances remind us that art can be our daily lives. So, there is a very kind of fine line between art and life, and this is where I like to use the fluidity of the, the concept of the word art. Um, because, um, in this sense, we can accept that rock art is a component, it, it's a common component of past societies. You see it everywhere, all around the world we have rock art. Um, it was present in you know, the, the community's ritual and daily activities. It was a form of engagement with the natural world. So um, it's, it's like a reflection of uh, the daily lives that are depicted on these hard surfaces that they can always look at, because they're always going to be there, provided they're not paintings open air. <laughs> um, so following this idea, hunting scenes become a significant theme to be portrayed by societies whose subsistence relied um, mostly upon it. Um, and the same is equal equally true for the uh, Paleolithic animals that were naturalistic uh, depicted. Um, oh, I forgot about that. Also, just like a work of art, the landscape setting of rock art will influence the way it is perceived by its audience, whether individually or collectively, uh, and therefore it implies an important decision making. Um, in, in Atlantic rock art, which is my specific um, topic, um, Atlantic rock art has a very geographical character. Uh, and in many cases, it seems obvious that the process of making was not random and that the motifs were carved according to a predetermined um, final result. Obviously, these are suggestions, um, but that's the, uh, the impression that we get. Um, right, so this is another part of my presentation, and I believe it's the last one. And uh, I would like to um, talk about two... Um, two cases where um, art and archaeology appear intimately related. Um, so the first case is um, Francis Bacon's um, excavation, I suppose, studio excavation. Um, <clears throat> so when the contents of Francis Bacon's um, studio were removed from London to be installed in Dublin in 1998, this operation was conducted with the assistance of archaeologists that were who were employed to deconstruct and excavate the site, um, uh, which were, which is it was renowned for its kind of chaotic, um, the chaotic contents. So uh, the team surveyed the studio and made elevation drawings, mapping out of uh, the spaces and the locations of the objects. They treated it as an as an archaeological site. There were about 7,000 items that were found in the studio and they were catalogued on a specially designed database before they were replaced in, in the gallery. So every item in the study has a database entry. Uh, it consists of an image, a factual account of each object, so just like we deal with our uh, archaeological uh, artifacts. Conservators and curators packed each of the items, including the dust of the walls, doors, floor, ceiling, everything was removed. So in Dublin, the studio was reassembled as a permanent installation in the city's Hugh Lane Gallery, uh, and everything appears exactly as Bacon left it, including the dust, because obviously the archaeological record allowed it to be reassembled in Dublin, just as it was in London. Um, and in her 2008 paper, Blaise O'Connor, she was one of the uh, archaeologists involved in this process, um, says that, and I'm quoting here, she was struck by the ease with which archaeological process could be so readily applied in this unusual context. The smooth conceptual shift required, and yet the strangeness and theatre of archaeology as a discipline that the project revealed. Um, archaeology um, as a performance event. So, and she continues by saying that the debitage and the de Tritus, the treatise, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, had built up all the familiar and complex laws of stratigraphy. Taphonomic forces, accumulation, sedimentation, reuse, repeated activity, truncation, chaîne opera opératoire. Uh, so these were, uh, was, were all there. So she was very familiar with the, uh, with, the, with the place, although it was very different from you know, our traditional archaeological sites. Um, 
My second case is um, a project called Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe, which was launched by Swiss artist Daniel Spurri. Um, and um, he's best known for his snare pictures, a type of assemblage of artwork in which he captures a group of objects um, such as remains of eaten meals, um, including plates, silverware, glasses, all of which are fixed on the tables, on the table or boards, and then displayed on the wall. So, um, on the other side of this project, um, there was an archaeologist, Jean-Paul Dumont, although this was the second archaeologist because the first one became a monk and was no longer attached to it. Um, and the title is a parody to uh, Manet's uh, painting, Le Déjeuner sous l'herbe. Um, so, in this project, Spurri offered a meal to 120 people, and this was uh, in 1983. And then he buried the tables that, as the, as the guests left them in a 60 meter long trench. 30 years after, he wanted to dig the site, but because that first archaeologist was not, no longer involved um, and he was unavailable to continue the project, they forgot about where the place was, where the table was buried. Um, and so they got another archaeologist, they did some geophysical um, survey, and then after they, you know, when they found the, uh, the place, uh, the table, they actually dug it with archaeological methods. So the result of the project was exhibited in several museums, but according to the archaeologist that was involved, um, the artist was actually interested, not really in this, but it was the whole process, you know, it was the people eating, the, the how they left the tables, or, you know, how things kind of aged under, under the earth. So it was the whole process that, that he was interested in. Um, so, to conclude, um, a key feature of both archaeology and art as academic disciplines is that they share the sense of being able to transcend individual experience as a means of reinvention and reinterpretation. So, like archaeologists, a great number of artists are digging up old stories, forgotten facts and undisclosed objects to reinvent, reinterpret and memorialize the past, but also the present. With this paper, and through the examples that I described, um, hopefully, um, I tried to demonstrate that art and archaeology can benefit from collaboration and be happy together. Um, so the examples described show that art and archaeology are visual and interested in materials as well as raw materials and, and the final products. And the two disciplines uh, share an interest in performance and exploring technologies, some of which are ancient technologies, and create narratives. So art and archaeology are site-specific and in many ways um, they're both ephemeral and open to interpretation as well as reinterpretation. So in archaeology we need material culture as a result of practice to understand the process of making as the original thoughts underpin the creational process, uh, practice are out of our reach. Um, so I think that is undeniable that the work and experience of contemporary artists with all its variety is valuable to us and may become an important tool in the construction of our interpretations and contribute to a wider understanding of the uh, past material culture and also the past societies. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.